What's the difference between a candidate and an activist? Let's talk about that. Focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, hey there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show, and thank you for joining us on, of course, another fun little episode. I am, as always, your humble host, joining you live from our Stratus IP studios here in lovely eastern Indiana. Don't let cyber attacks or outdated business technology put your company at risk. Learn more at briannicholshow.com forward slash Stratus IP. Well, folks, in the greater liberty movement, you're going to find more often than not that a lot of our candidates running for office are also our most vocal activists. But is that the best way to approach running for office? Well, it's not uncommon to see a candidate run for office and then lose only to become even more vocal. Heck, as an example, when Ron Paul lost his bid for the presidencies in 2018 and 2012, he became even more outspoken about it than he did before and became an icon that led the liberty movement to where it is today. So today we go back to 2012, where Larry Sharp joined the program to help outline how both candidates and activists are needed in the greater liberty movement and how each serves very different unique roles in the greater scheme of things. But first, we're going to go ahead and give a shout out to today's sponsor, and that is the Libertarian Party of Illinois. Folks, if you are interested in uh, finding not just a third option, but truly a different option, the mission of the Libertarian Party of Illinois is to help elect libertarians to public office and to move public policy in a libertarian direction. The LP of Illinois believes that everyone owns themselves and that no bureaucrat knows better than you on what you need or want. When peaceful people engage in voluntary cooperation, the most number of people are served. And if you agree, help us restore liberty both in the United States, but also in the Libertarian Party of Illinois at lpillinois.org and bring back peace and liberty in our lifetimes. One more time, lpillinois.org. All right. And with that being said, on to the show, Larry Sharp here on The Brian Nichols Show. I am here. I made it. I mean, I, I know you've been dissing me for a while. <laughs> I've been begging you to come on. You keep telling me, take a hike, Sharp. Oh, I don't want goodness. to do with you. Larry Finally, Sharp. You, you brought me back on. Thank Larry you. Sharp. I thought you were an honorable man. Come on, tell my audience all those, those falsehoods. <laughs> Larry Sharp, it's always a pleasure to have you on, my friend. And you've been so busy over at the Sharp Way. Uh, you've been blown up there in New York. Uh, obviously, you ran for governor back in 2018 as a libertarian. You had the most success yep. of any libertarian candidate out there. And you got ballot access for libertarians going forward in New York, which is a big deal, especially. So I actually had Assemblyman Mark Walsh on the show talking about the, the budget they had and how they snuck through. We had to get a certain threshold for for ballot access going forward into their budget it's insanity so you're fighting the good fight larry let's kind of uh, reintroduce yourself though it's been a while since we've been on the show the sharp way larry sharp who the heck is this this larry sharp guy we've heard so much about kind of give us a uh, the, the spark notes who you are and, and kind of your path sadly liberty. sadly people can't see how handsome i am because that's my number one thing is my good looks but besides that um i actually uh look i'm a consultant a trainer from marine Marine Corps birthday was two days ago. Uh, I don't know when this is being aired. Sorry. Marine Corps birthday was November 10th. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the Veterans Day was November 11th. So it's my time of year. Uh, so look, I'm trying to make things work. I, I'm trying to get people to understand that if you want Americans to change and be better, it's not about jumping on the bandwagon saying the other guy's bad. The other guy's bad just increases fear and everything that people liberty lovers hate that we hate every single one of those things came from scared americans the war on terror the war on drugs uh prohibition uh taking away guns every single thing that we hate came from americans being afraid so i'm trying my best to get our message out without making americans afraid because once they're afraid we're in trouble well, so that's the, the the dirty little secret, right? Americans, I think, by and large, kind of want to be afraid. And I, I've, I've seen this across the board, Larry, and it's interesting. I've heard more and more from some folks out there. They just, they kind of want to be told what to do. And it's kind of a weird thing to hear. But then at the same point in time, I kind of get it. You look 
across the centuries and we've always had kind of whatever there's always some body out there that's kind of giving you the guiding light whether it's you're looking into your religion or in this case we're looking to government it seems a lot of people are looking for the the right way and to your point that led you to do the sharp way right so you've been focusing on promoting liberty trying to actually get people to realize that Liberty is, I think, a very easy thing to understand when we apply it to our daily lives. So, Larry, let's kind of start off the sharp way. What's kind of been your mission and kind of what's been your, 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 I guess, your shtick, if you will, the thing that has been the catching point? Yeah. What, what I am and what makes some people very angry at me is I'm the recruiter, right? The people that I bring in are not libertarians, right? I'm a Marine. I didn't walk into boot camp a Marine. I walked in a green 17-year-old knucklehead from the Bronx, and then three months later, I came on a Marine. So I bring people to the movement who aren't libertarian, and the amount of people who get mad at me, well, you got libertarian. I know. If, if, that's the point. If you, yes, that's the point. How are we going to grow if we don't talk to people who aren't libertarians, right? Which is why the sharp way is it the liberty way. It's not that. It's the sharp way. In fact, I rarely have libertarians on the sharp way. It is very rare that I have libertarians. I almost only have Democrats, Republicans, Greens, Independents, because my goal is twofold. My audience is give or take 50% libertarian, about 30% either Republican or conservative lean liberty, about 15% Democrat or liberal lean liberty, and about 5%, I don't know, just think I'm good looking. I don't know what it is, but about that, right? I got something in that area, right? So my goal is to get people who are on who aren't libertarian, so that libertarians can see them and go, oh, that's why she thinks that. Oh, that's why he thinks that. They're not just evil people, statists, who think taxation's awesome. That's not what it is. They actually have agendas and issues and things that they're concerned about. Maybe I shouldn't hate them because they aren't libertarian enough. Maybe I can have that conversation. And the next thing is, some of those people come, and when they're done, they start thinking better about us too. Like they know I'm a libertarian. I wear it on my sleeve, right? It's so clear I'm libertarian. I just don't yell it at them. So when I talk to them, they realize, oh, and then now something else happens. People come on my show who aren't libertarian all the time. Why? Because I don't own them. Because I don't yell at them. Because I don't call them names. Now, sometimes people in my comment section do, but I don't, right? So I don't do that. So they can come on my show and know I'm not going to yell at them. Even though, I mean, before I've had actual socialists on my show and I asked him the question, I literally said this. Okay. So how are you going to decide? It's a true story. How are you going to decide what businesses you seize? <laughs> and they answered the question. Like he was like, well, this is how we'll do it. I'm like, okay, got you. <laughs> I mean, right. So, but, but that's the kind of conversation we have to have. And then, but the funny part is though, he then began to back off because he hurt himself. And he's never had to have an audience that didn't think that's a one seizing businesses. Wonderful idea. (laughs) He's never had an audience that would go, you sure you want to do that? He's never had that. Well, he had it. So he had to rethink some things. So I I think that's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm trying to bring more people together. I really believe that the only way of fixing our country is to have a viable libertarian party. And the way we do that, People ask me all the time, Larry, do you talk about liberty or libertarianism? I it about libertarianism. I don't. I don't. I just give people real solutions for their problems that are liberty based. That's what I do. Yes. If I'm winning, then I, then a person says to me, Oh, you must be insert their party. Right? Oh, you're obviously a Democrat because they're a Democrat or you're obviously a Republican because they're a Republican. That's what I do. People often say we have to make sure the part libertarian name and party is a good brand. How do you do that? By yelling taxation theft? No. Mm-hmm. By actually being a person they want to talk to and listen to, and then that face becomes libertarianism. You know, how many people came to our party because of, you know, Ron Paul, because of uh, Ga- uh, uh Gary Johnson, me Gary Johnson, not me Gary Johnson, but me Gary Johnson. Um, you know, Harry Brown, right? So many people came to our party because of a face that they go, oh, that guy makes sense. That guy makes sense. And then, oh, he's a what, librarian? Oh, no, libertarian. Oh, libertarian, go on, libertarian. Okay, that, right, 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 right. 
Yes, that's how we do it. And I think that's really the answer. And that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And, and you hit the, the nail on the head, right? Not focusing on winning, right? We can't. And I think you, you, you're starting to focus more on the greater problem we've seen, not just in the libertarian movement, but also I think in our little hive minds that we've all developed is that we get into our little group think, you know, groups on Facebook and we talk to each other and we've gotten all of our ideas so pinpointed down. But then when we have to actually go out and talk to people out in real life, we, we're woefully lacking, um, because yes. we're, we're so, we're so, focused on being right that we're not focused on how can we take these ideas which are in some worlds uh, very alien to some people but actually to show them that it is yes to your point larry the solution to a lot of the problems that yes. they have in their lives and you you're a sales guy i'm a sales guy that's not a bad thing and i think there's been a really Absolutely. there's been a really negative connotation with sales because people think of the snake oil salesman but no salesmen mm -hmm. are are problem solvers they they bring yep. solutions to the table and too often libertarians have been afraid i think to bring up our libertarian solutions and more so just we look to attack things because i think we yes. look at the left and the right and say well if we if we present a solution that's not their solution though they're not going to be on our side but we can attack the same problem like we're republicans and we say yeah obamacare is bad but then we're like and we shouldn't replace it with anything let the free market go to go to town republicans are gonna be like wait you mean we're not going to repeal and replace like it was the mantra back in 2012 and i think that's where a lot of libertarians have lost some folks so larry i'm gonna ask you is it maybe a, a problem that libertarians just haven't had too many libertarian solutions or is it that we haven't been vocal enough in presenting our libertarian solutions in a way that folks can understand we don't have libertarian solutions we have rhetoric that's what we have is rhetoric and history lessons that's not impressive right this is how this is how the average libertarian asks the question so how are you going to fix education well let me tell you how bad it is and blah, 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 and all the reasons on why it's bad and how government screwed it up and the answer is get government out. That doesn't make anybody feel better who doesn't already, you know, think that. If you're a libertarian, you clap your hands. Yeah. Oh, amazing. And there's, and, it's, and I want to be clear, there is a place for that, but that, that space is taken up already. There are 85,000 liberty podcasts who yell that stuff all day long. And that's wonderful. That motivates our base. It keeps them excited. It gets our activists up in the morning saying, go out and be activists. We need them to be activists. And I want to be clear. I'm talking from a candidate's point of view, not an activist point of view. Sometimes activists should be yelling taxation is theft or should be making people angry. That's an activist's job. So I'm actually okay with that. I'm not okay with candidates doing it. Candidates have to be only solution based. Activists can be both or either depending upon their audience, right? So I still want to motivate my activists, but we already have that. I'm trying to create something that we don't have, which is how to get candidates that have actual solutions. If a candidate just says, get government out, here's a history lesson. No one says yes to that. And we see by our results as we keep getting 2% every single election. We see that by our results. But when you actually start giving them solutions, everyone who remembers me from 2018, I've only run one time. People think, you're always running. I've run one time. And I still make, I make impact and I don't have to run. I can still be a decent activist, a decent person who supports people. I can still get to raise money for people without having to run. But when I ran, I had actual solutions. That's why I got on Joe Rogan. Because he loved my bridge idea. My, my, my leasing naming rights to bridge. That's why I got on the show. People got on the show. I got on people's show because I did my regulate, um, ma uh, cannabis like onions. Yep. Right. Those types of my K through 10 versus K through 12 idea. Right. These are the ideas that were libertarian based. The ideas you can get good service without having to raise taxes and without forcing people. And that's all my policies. My policies are how do I get better service? without raising one tax dollar and without forcing anybody to do anything. That's how it's going to fix our roads. That's how it's going to fix our schools. That's how it's going to fix everything. And the actual answer, that's what turned Democrats and Republicans onto me. And so as candidates, we must do better. We're bad at it. And we have to talk to people that aren't libertarian, to your point, right? Because you would not have won over, Larry, liber non-libertarians if you had just only gone to libertarian podcast, right? Yes. You had to go speak to people outside of our comfort zone because, I mean, yep. at the end of the day, if, if we're trying to, you know, change people's minds, we actually have to talk to the people whose minds we're trying to change. And I, yes. I've seen that, right? That's, that's just, 
I get so frustrated when I watch libertarians in, in their groups of, of, you know, on Facebook and they talk all these, these delusions of grandeur. And I say that because they're talking about all these great things that they're gonna do. And, and Larry, I don't know about you, but I've seen this way too often that it's always a matter of what we're gonna do, not a matter of what we've actually accomplished. And I, I'm, I'm at that point, right? And I think this is maybe the sales guy in me, right? But I'm looking for KPIs. I'm looking for what are we actually yep. getting in return from what we're putting forth in our efforts? And to your point, are we going to keep doing this one, two percent game every single time or are we going to demand better? And I think, again, that requires Why do you think I didn't run for office this year. Mm. Yeah, because I knew I couldn't deliver. Hit. I knew Expand upon that. Yeah, I couldn't deliver. Right. I say this. Here is the issue that we have in our party consistently. Someone tries to run and they run because I'm got I'm going to spew liberty and people want liberty. First off, that's a lie. We've been telling ourselves that lie forever. Americans don't want liberty and freedom. What they want is answers for their problems. It's our job to show them that the way is through liberty and freedom. But they don't actually want that. They want answers for that. That's why they keep voting for the same idiots. Well, people finally got to get a choice. They don't want choice. If they wanted choice, we wouldn't have only two parties, would we? Clearly, the evidence of these lies we've been telling ourselves is not true for decades. I say it, I get yelled at. How dare you say that? Because if the evidence is there, guys, what Americans want is solutions for their problems. It's our job to give them liberty based solutions. If we fail at that, they won't vote for us. But anyway, I I digress. Yes. My point is people run thinking those two things, get their asses kicked, as I did, too, by the way. My two percent was not awesome. So I'm not sitting here acting like I'm all great. I screwed up, too. But the difference is they they run, get two percent and do one of two things. 2% 2% great. See, look how good we did. We got 2% and did the exact same thing again. 2% sucks. That's not great. What is the impact you made? Now, Shane Hazel got 2% in, in, in Georgia too, but he forced the runoff. That's impact. That's a I'll big take deal. that 2% every day of the week. Amen. That I want. But I don't want just 2%. I want impact in some way, shape, or form. My 2% got us ballot access. That's impact. If, if I can get, if I can double or triple number of registered libertarians, I tripled mine. I went from 7,000 to 21,000. That's impact. I'll buy that. But that's the first thing. They say it's great and keep going. Or second, libertarians suck and leave the party. That's what we do. I'm trying to be the change that I want. Run for office, get your ass kicked, learn from it, help others stay. That's what I'm doing. I want others to do that. And I hope more will. And to be forward, I am seeing a lot of that. This party is on the move like there's no tomorrow. We have people who are doing better, people who are staying, more people who are who are broadening our donor base, people who are getting more points. I mean, look at look at what uh, Harrington did in in Arkansas. Look at what Rainwater did in Indiana. Look at the wins we got in Wyoming. I mean, we are we're making impact, so we are actually growing. What I want to do is now not fall backwards. And my worry now is, see, if we just would have been more principled, we would have won. No, the principles are not our problem. They're not. Communication is our problem. Dedication is our problem. Infrastructure building is our problem. These are our problems we have to work on. If we work on those, the principle will come. We got that. There were 14,000 podcasts talking about principle every day. We got that down. Let's not go to 15,000 of those. Let's instead build the other aspects so we can keep growing. Yes. Because I believe in my heart this is the only way to fix this country. There's no other way. The the two main parties are making us deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in in, in our own bubbles. I mean, people are, are happy that Republicans are rushing over to parlor instead of Facebook. I'm not. That's just another form of division. They're like, good riddance. No, no, I can't talk to them. How am I ever going to convert them if they keep running away from me? So people tease me. Well, Larry, you going to go on parlor now? Yes, I am. Happily. Yep. I'm going to go on whatever I need to be on. Yes. I'm going to go on parlor. I'm going to go on MeWe. I'm going to go on Facebook and every one of them. I'm, dude, I'm greedy. I want 7 billion libertarians. If I don't get 7 billion libertarians, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm greedy. And I can't get them 
unless I talk to them. Yes. So I guess I'm going to Parlor 2 then or wherever the hell they go. Well, we need our it's marketplace. Fine. That's the thing. Like people, so you can pick your marketplace, but if you're selling ideas, right, the idea is it's not a product. You can't keep, it's not a renewal. Like, oh, you're going to go buy your, your can of Pepsi every single day. Liberty is one of those things where it has to be transferable. And there is, you yes. know, a, a finite amount of people on this earth. It's not just a matter of trying to always push the ideas forward. But to your point, Larry, to not see them go backwards, and I would say that mm-hmm. we're at a very dangerous point right now where a lot of yes. people are trying to silence and push ideas away. So I would say it's yep. more on us to also get away from the tradition. I say traditional is funny because in 2020, that seems like the only way we can really talk to each other is over the Internet. But t- <laughs> to mask up if you have to based on, I mean, where the hell ever you are and go out and talk to people in their communities. I mean, I had um, Angela McCardle on the show back here on Monday and she's uh, the LP chair out in um, in L.A. And she was, you yep. know, she's been leading these uh, these protests trying to, to protest the lockdowns. And, you know, I don't care if you're pro lockdown, anti lockdown, but she's going out and she's talking to people in her community about issues yep. that matter to them. And that's exactly yep. what libertarians need to do. It's also, I would ask Larry, you know, your, your thoughts on this. I've approached things. When you're talking to people, you have to be, you know, having the conversation that they're having in their minds and kind of look to see what's their bed bug problem. What's their, their, you know, their, they're nine o'clock at night. They're getting ready to go to bed and that idea just pops in their head. And they're like, ah, oh, that, that's right there. I still have to take care of that. Right. What has been the bed bug problem that Americans have had that we have not discussed and how do we focus on that in a libertarian way that will pique their interest that then we can push them towards the other libertarians out there to, to educate them along the way well the funny thing is when I do events and I do a lot of events I did 62 events in five weeks trying to drum up support for my uh you know for the libertarian party this year um at the end of the uh of the presidential candidate uh candidacy didn't work as well as I wanted to, but I did it anyway. Um, I cover my state every year. I, I go to every county every year. And when God I do that, <laughs> yes, I, I, I do it every time. And when I do it, when I get there early, I literally meet people and ask them why they came. What's their issue? I ask that question because it's different places, right? And then I then make my presentation based upon what they told me. So that's how I do an event every time. I go at what, what's your issue? What's your issue? Okay, great. I bring those things up. And the thing that I hear constantly is, holy crap, he actually answered my question. Like I cared about homeschooling and he gave me an actual plan in New York State to support homeschooling. Oh my God, right? He cares. He, I, I'm mad about my small business and he gave me a plan to support small business. He gave me a plan to fix potholes, right? I gave him an actual plan to fix models, which in every plan I've ever had, no new taxes, no forcing. How Those are my two rules. Yep. When I sat with my policy team, which I did for literally a year, every Monday night, we, we sat together for an hour. The rules were always the same. No new taxes, no mandates. Otherwise, it's not one of my policies. Like those are the rules I may not break. Anything else we can work on, we'll talk about how we're going to go down and go up, but two rules that were total rule breakers, that that they were deal breakers. No new taxes, no more spending in any way, shape, or form, no more spending at all, zero, not even a penny, and no mandates whatsoever. You do that, let's talk about policy. That's what I would do. So the issues I found, almost those, believe it or not, they're either hyper-local, like my potholes, right? right? Like hyper-local, or why is Walmart coming here, right? It's hyper-local. Or it is so broad and affects nothing. Like, you know, we got to stand up to China, which means nothing. Right, exactly. It doesn't affect your life at all. It means nothing. So either hyper-local or up high in the sky means nothing. Those are the, what I found constantly. You know, we, you know, we got to support our troops. It means nothing. That's not a thing, right? But to that person, yeah, it is. I, I, I'll never forget this. It's 2018. I'm in North Country in New York State. Home sweet home. And yep, there we go. And for, and for those who don't know about that area, you know, people have had farms in those areas for literally hundreds of years. Yes, my hundreds family of one of them. Yes, absolutely. There we go. Hundreds of years. It's a common thing in upstate New York. Um, not so much Long Island, New York City, but way common upstate New York and west of New York. Those two areas. Very common, have, have a, fa- a farm in a family for hundreds of years. So this guy tells me he's got a farm that's sixth generation farm. 
he's in trouble, he's gonna lose it, you know, that's the it's the end for him. And he had a question for me. So I thought, okay, he's gonna ask about my farm plan, which I had one for both farmers and dairy farmers. For those who don't know, New York State has a lot of dairy farmers. So both dairy farmers and regular farmers, you know, which which one it is, I, I assume that. You know what his question was? 2018. His question was, what do you think about Trump? Trump wasn't running in 2018. Yeah. Trump was going to be the president for the next two years, regardless of what happened, whether I won or lost. Trump being president wasn't going to affect his farm in any way, shape, or form. That kind of thing is what I saw. Up there. Didn't matter. Didn't affect him at all. Or the 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 micro thing. But the top thing, what they're actually asking, and this is what a, a, a person has to understand this. What they're actually asking is, can I trust you? That's the actual question. But it, but they say it like, got it. Don't we have, how are we going to stand up to China? That he doesn't actually want an answer. He's asking, can I trust you? What do you think about Trump? He doesn't actually want an answer. He's asking, can I trust you? And that is what we see as a third party more than anything. We are seen as unknown and untrust, untrustworthy. They, if you're from the left, you know all Republicans are evil, you can't trust them, and all Democrats are wonderful and perfect. If you're from the right, you know all Republicans are wonderful and perfect, and you can't trust any Democrat. It's clear. You know where that is. Absolutely. But, but libertarians? Ooh. That's where we get those questions. And if you could answer that question right, which means the right answer, by the way, is an answer that he believes is true. That doesn't blame anybody. That's the right answer. And we have to start building the resume, right? This is one thing I think a lot of libertarians, they they fail to realize or just at the very least fail to acknowledge is that your average person, they do care about the resume. They care that you know, when they go to vote for the person that they say, oh, you know, I'm voting for my U.S. senator. Were they a former state senator or a former assembly person? Uh, when they're voting for assembly, were they a former, former county legislator or a former town supervisor? Those are things that actually matter. So I would say it's also imperative that libertarians, and this actually goes to a former LP chair candidate Todd Hagopian's um, approach is, is focusing on local elections. We really have to dig deep in, in focusing on bringing good, like, true libertarian solutions to localities and running people who are talking about those issues. And Larry, one thing that I think is really great, and you're exemplifying not just in New York State, because people think of New York State as this like blue haven. It's not. It's it's like an <laughs> entirely different state than people think. Upstate New York yep. is as red as Texas. And Absolutely. you you would see county by county, each county has fundamentally different things that matter to that county. And if that does yep. not speak to the 50 states that we have as a nation, I, I think if we're libertarian candidates, we have a responsibility to, to preach almost this, this federal federalist approach, right? This hyper local, to your point, approach on how to live your life. Because at the end of the day, I, I think your average person is is going to be empathetic to the idea of okay, if I'm in St. Lawrence County or if I'm in the Bronx, right? Should the person in St. Lawrence County be living by the exact same laws that the person in the Bronx is, and vice versa? No, because the areas are completely not only in, in terms of the populations, but geography. The the, the setting. It's, St. Lawrence is physically the largest county in New York State. Exactly, it, it's the third yep. largest east of the Mississippi River. It's a huge yep. county. It's my home county. Yep. It's like people don't realize that these counties. I mean, they it's are. Sad that I know that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you were in all 62 <laughs> counties that you were driving across New York State, Larry, my God, your 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 GPS <laughs> must have you you have every single landmark checked off as you're going through my Niagara Falls all the way to Plattsburgh and in between. But Larry, that's the thing. People I think are are they're looking for some answers right now because everything's yep. just so chaotic. And we need to break through the white noise. But again, as we we kind of go full circle and put a bow in this episode, to your point, it requires us to get out of our own comfort zones and actually go to the people that we're trying to convince and meet them where they're at. And I would say that requires us to get uncomfortable. We have to go out of our comfort zones, go to where they are. And, and honestly, it's going to be one of those things where you're the only libertarian in the event. But, you know, hey, listen, be be proud, be courageous and speak your truth. I think but, people but the are question more here becomes, are you going there as an activist or as a candidate? Right. Right. If yes, you're that's going very there true. As an activist, your goal is to get people to actually care about the issue. Yes. Right. That's you, a lot of people don't even know that that the that that the military industrial complex is a massive jobs program. Right. Most people don't even. I tell story all the time. There was a there was someone I was doing a, a teaching. I, I, uh, when when King Andrew the Second, His Majesty, uh, all hail the King, allowed me to teach before I became non essential. I used to do some teaching, 
And when I would teach, you know, in, in one of the classes I was in, I'm, I'm teaching a class. These are the, the audience. My, my, my students are educated, credentialed New York City workers, professionals, mostly men, but some women all over 30, some as old as 60. That's the environment I'm in. At that point, I never talk about politics unless it's during a break or someone asks. During a break, someone says out loud, knowing that I know about, about politics, goes, yay, I'm so glad we had the Fed. Man, we had the Fed. We have, the crash would have been tr- terrible. The Fed, the Fed saved us during the crash. He said that. Someone looked at me like, yeah, right? Like, what do me to go, yeah, what do me to do that? And I said, all I said was, do you guys know that the Fed it's like a private bank. It's basically it's a, a cartel system is what it really is. Every one of them. No, 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 no. <laughs> I said, check, you got, you got your phones, Google it. And they were like, stupid Larry. And they went and Googled it. And obviously here, whoa, oh my God, wow. Nobody knew that. These were educated. These were credentialed adults who work for the city in New York. They did not know the Fed was a private bank. Activists need to be more active in that community and let them know. Now, a candidate doesn't have to do that. Right. A candidate has to have an answer for the crash. That's the difference between the two. If, if they don't know what's going on, the activist hasn't done a job. If they now know what's going on and go, Larry, how are you going to fix the Fed? Activists did their job. Now the candidate has the answer. Here's how we deal with this. Here's our first step. Here's phase one. And I know in this case, as you said, local, in this specific case, the state constitution doesn't allow this, but it allows that. So we'll have to make this change or that change or banking changes here or shifts there. That's what a candidate has to know. We do that. We will start rock and rolling without question. We will. But I want to go to one more step you talked about, the idea of you know, being hyper local. Localism is one of our best, one of our best ideas that we have. A lot of people like that. You're right, right? The the problem we have in New York State, and you know, is that everyone upstate goes, New York City runs everything, right? And a part of that's true. But imagine if you could just be local. The people who live in Brooklyn, man, they love Brooklyn. So why would I change Brooklyn? They really love it. Have you met people from Brooklyn? Man, they love Brooklyn. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. They think Brooklyn's a separate city. They love Brooklyn. So why would I change it? They love it. And let the people in St. Lawrence County be St. Lawrence. If we let everybody be each other, then St. Lawrence doesn't care about Brooklyn. Them crazy people in Brooklyn do what they want. Brooklyn go, them crazy people in St. Lawrence do what they want. And life is good. I think that's that really works well. So I wanted to, I wanted to stress that piece. But there's one more piece I want to add on top of that. Whether we should worry about local or non-local, we can do both. But the answer is very different answers for each. The top of our ticket has the least chance of victory, but the highest chance of press. So when we're picking the top of our ticket, I know it's going to sound horrible. Principles are important, but not the only piece. It's more about how much money can they raise? How will they in front of a camera? How can they begin to take that press and then bring it down? Because bottom of the ticket has best chance of victory, but least chance of press. So we've got to rotate that. So when I ran in 2018, I got tons of press. So what did I do in 2019? I covered the state again and gave that press to all local people. The press came to see me again. Oh, it's Larry Sharp, the governor guy. Yes, it is. And today I'm talking about this guy who's running for a local office. And we had 103 victories in New York State in 2019. Love it. We went from zero victories to 103. That's from my race. That's how you do it. That's how we can do both, right? Because what eventually happens is, to, to, to Al Gopian's point, the junior people began to be, they become our bench. And then they begin to come up. But I can't get them elected if I can't get them pressed, which is why I need good top of the ticket. Top of the ticket gets in the press so that they can actually win the damn thing. So we need both. It's almost as if all this stuff kind of, uh, I don't know, 
links together in some way, Larry. Yes. It's weird how that all happens. And you know what? That's why people need to make sure that they're, they're listening to every single possible person they can in our movement who knows a thing or two about what they're talking about. And that's why I cannot encourage folks enough to head over to the sharp way. Make sure they give a, a subscribe over there. And Larry obviously will include all the links for your social media in the show notes. With that being said, this is the uh, the part of the show, you know, I, I I don't usually do, but I think with somebody like you, Larry, I think uh, my audience, last words of wisdom, right? Because, you know, we're, we're wrapping up here in 2020, we're going into the holidays, and I think um, folks, they're, they're a little burnt out, and they're looking for a little optimism as we go forward, the libertarian movement, they got a nice kick between the legs, and we're recovering, we're licking our wounds, so what's some, mm-hmm. some things to look forward to as we head into 2021? I'll do two things. I'll give you generic words of wisdom and then some good, some good views. Generic words of wisdom. It's always emotion and then logic. Connection before you solve the problem. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So first talk about things they care about, connect with them, and then give them the solution. You don't just want to yell, you're wrong, I'm right. The way we're going to win this thing is not through winning arguments or winning uh, debates. You don't see me debate or argue. It's not what I do. There's no value in it. What do I do? I have conversation after conversation after conversation after conversation. In 2016, I put out a 10-year plan. I'm only four years in. I got six left because I knew this would take time. This is changing the culture of both the party and and the country. And it takes, as a Marine, I know. The goal of a Marine is to make more leaders. So I'm trying to make more leaders. I only ran one time. Now I'm supporting others. I'm trying to make others win too. So that's the words of wisdom. Now for the future. We are absolutely on the move. There is no doubt. The evidence is everywhere. It's demonstrably true. The amount of time we've got in the press, the amount of people who are saying they're supporting us. Joe Rogan said he voted libertarian. I mean, there are so many pieces. And... They're fighting us harder than ever, which is the biggest thing. As they begin to fight us, if you notice, every one of them, the right insults us, the left dismisses us. That's how you know we're winning. The more the right is angry at us and the more the left dismisses us, the more we're winning. Every Republican uh, will talk about us voting. was like, you dummies, why would you be so stupid to vote for this? You got to vote for Trump. And every Democrat goes, stupid, wasting your vote, throwing away. Left is dismissive, right is aggressive. The more they're doing it, the more we're winning. So it's there everywhere. We're making impact. It is working. We have better candidates. We have more money. Everything's going well. If you think about how, if you think about how this COVID crisis should have devastated us, it didn't. It didn't. We were still able to make impact and get some victories through it all. And here's the best part, the best of it all. So many people who've run now actually feel supported and they're staying. That didn't happen before. And the person I use as the post child that is, is Donald Rainwater in Indiana. Bingo. He ran, he ran local, got his butt kicked local, learned his lesson, brushed off, got back on the horse and kicked ass as a governor candidate. And now Indiana has infrastructure to support a whole lot more people, both donors, volunteers, activists. The infrastructure is built because of guys like him. This is working. And the most important boss, it's the only way to save us. Democrats, Republicans aren't going to save us. There has to be a group of people who are going to say, you can be as liberal as you want to be or as conservative as you want to be. Just stop forcing your views on others. That's who we are. You want to live in Brooklyn and be super liberal? Good on you, man. If you want to live in St. Lawrence County and be super conservative, good on you. Or or find some place in the middle. All good. As long as you stop forcing others to be like you, we're good. There's a lot of hope for us. Don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. I mean, hey, let's just leave it there. Larry Sharp, as always, a fantastic conversation. The Sharp Way with Larry Sharp. I'll make sure I include the link to that in the show notes. Larry, as always, thanks for so much for joining the Brian Nichols Show. Good seeing you, brother. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up our throwback episode here. Going back to our conversation in 2020 with Larry Sharp. I hope you got as, as much enjoyment and value as I did talking about the difference between candidates 
and activists. Yes, very important for both roles, but it's important to know that role. So if you got some value from today's episode, do me a favor, go ahead and give it a share. When you do, please go ahead and tag yours truly at B Nichols Liberty. And also, did you know you can go ahead and check this out over on YouTube? If not, well, surprise, surprise, head over to BrianNicholsShow.com, where, yes, you can find today's episode on where 90% of you find the program, the podcast version of the show, but also find us over on our YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey, wherever it is you get your content. Please, all I ask is do me a favor, hit that little notification bell, and also do me a favor, hit that little uh, magical subscribe button as well while you're there. And also, folks, by the way, uh, I mentioned it earlier in the week, but make sure you've hit that subscribe button because this week we're wrapping things up tomorrow and Friday. We have great conversations with uh, Maj Tori as well as with Mark Lobliner, uh, two great guys leading the charge and helping really uh, fight for a different way of doing messaging. You're looking at what Maj is doing in the Liberty Movement and what Mark is uh, doing in the, the MAGA Movement. We're going to talk about the different approaches, what's working, and the, the feedback they're receiving. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. And oh, by the way, uh, yesterday's episode was also a throwback episode. We went and talked to our good friend Kevin Vallier about how we can trust each other in such a polarized age. If you missed that conversation, no worries. I'm going to include that right here below. And also, uh, YouTube's going to recommend a video for you to watch as well. So go ahead and check that out. And uh, right here in the middle, hit the subscribe button if you have not had the chance yet. But otherwise, folks, uh, make sure uh, you, you hit subscribe again so you aren't missing our episodes that are airing Thursday and Friday. But other than that, that's all I have for you. Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show. We'll see you tomorrow. For listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.